Great. So this is a little bit of a selfish question, but when should a client come and talk to you? Yeah, great question. I honestly think to have a mortgage broker in your phone at all times, whether you own a house right now, you're looking for a house, or even if you're, you know, you just graduated high school and you're starting to think, hey, maybe I should own a house at some point in my life. It's always good to have a contact in the mortgage broker space. Mm -hmm. Well, so, make a plan, right? You totally. can set them on a path. Absolutely. And I think like just having somebody that you can bounce questions off of, you can get a pre-approval on if, if when it comes to it, when you put your offer in, yeah. then obviously we can help you, you know, get the actual mortgage together. But to have somebody that you can rely on and trust and answer your questions as you go, if you're buying your first home, if you're buying your 10th home, yeah. I think having a mortgage broker is almost as important as having your doctor yeah. when it comes to your finances. You have to have somebody that you can run your ideas past and thoughts and get that pre-approval, which is super important. Um, but yeah, I think like anytime you become an adult, you need to have a mortgage broker. So. Awesome. Very well said because we don't want people going, we don't want to go show houses and people falling in love with these houses. Then they find out that they can't afford them. They're, they're disappointed. It kind of puts a bad taste in their mouth. So we want to take the, the, the right steps in, in, in order to help everybody through, through this process. Yeah. And that's the whole pre-approval process. So we do several a week and essentially that's us looking at credit. We look at your income, we look at your debt load and we give you a reasonable amount that the banks will likely say yes to. So if, if you say, earn 80 or $90,000 a year, we can probably ballpark in that 350 to 400,000 range. If you're looking at houses for 700,000, you either need to hook up and get married <laughs> or get, a, get somebody to partner. co-sign for you or buy with a, a friend or a partner or something, right? So that's a big part of our process is just making sure people have reasonable expectations about what they can afford. But And being truthful when filling out that application even. <laughs> totally. And we yeah. see that too. It's like, uh, yeah, I make $140,000, $150,000 a year in the application. Then you get the documents and it shows a hundred. Yeah. And we see that a lot actually with um, oil field workers because they get living out allowances and expenses mm -hmm. like that, that you can't use mm -hmm. for income. So. It's always good to just run through the full process to understand exactly what you can afford. And, and know what you're getting into, really. Oh, yeah, absolutely, and I, I have some people that um, will come and say, hey, I want a house for 700 or $800,000, and I show them a four or $5,000 a month payment, they're like, maybe, maybe scale not. back a bit. Yeah. Right? So there's also that realism that you have to understand that yes, you can have this big, beautiful home, but mm -hmm. if it's gonna cost you an arm and a leg, it, it might not be the right fit. So. Well, even going off of that, I know a lot of times you fill out the online application and that number shoots out right away. Yeah. What does that number really mean? Is that like, absolutely, they're good for that number? Is it 100%? What can somebody assume once that comes up? Yeah, I would probably say like 99 out of 100 times that is not an accurate number that you see <laughs> on those, on those yeah. calculators and things because what it's not considering, unless you've actually pulled your credit, it's probably not considering how much debt you have, student loan payments, car payments are always a killer mm. um, and all that. And it's also, it doesn't, I mean, some of the calculators do this, but not all of them calculate property taxes properly and all that stuff counts towards how much you can afford. Mm -hmm. And the other thing as well, when people are filling those out, they often will put income, unless you're salaried, like you, if you have variable rate or variable income, sorry, um, there's different ways to quantify that income. So say somebody gets a job this month and they're gonna be working out in Sparrow and making $150,000 a year, but just starting that job, base salary is probably 80 to 90,000, but then they get all this overtime. Right. They think that, hey, I make 150 grand a year now. Yeah. The banks will not accept that until you have two years of oh, overtime history. history. Uh -huh. So again, so that that's a big one we see is like, hey, I make all this money, I have all this overtime, but you've only had that job for three months, so it's not really earned money yet until you can show up for two years. So we see that a lot with those calculators. Mm -hmm. If the calculator told me I could afford this, mm -hmm. now you're telling me this. Right, and or I'm, commission sales, like how do you so navigate that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Yeah, so. I had a mortgage person say, can we better off working at A&W? I could see the bill, I could see the <laughs> paycheck. Yeah, so commission sales is a tricky one because you can go into commission sales and make really, really good money. The bank will not give you a mortgage until you have two full tax years of commission sales. So you have to file that income as commission sales. You have to pay the tax on it. You have to report it. And then that's what the bank will use. So I became a broker four years ago 
it was a struggle for me to get a mortgage based on my income because I was in commission sales and I went from a salary position to commission. Right. And what yeah, about a co-signer though for somebody on commission? Yeah, you can absolutely have, use a co-signer. Just the only thing is you are now relying 100% on that co-signer's income. So you still zero. don't get any of it? Zero. Okay. Well, right. good to know, right? Like yeah. people just don't know. And if yeah. it wasn't commission sales, is it three months or instead of two years or how long um, does it take? It, it, it's, it depends. Okay. And it, honestly, everything in the bank and the mortgage world depends. depends. Like, I'm not <laughs> kidding. Everything is like, oh yeah, we could probably squeak that one by. Yeah. So say you have an electrician and you have a journeyman electrician and he just moves companies, he could be working there for one day. The bank will still give him a mortgage. doesn't have to be three months, oh, but wow. if you have an electrician who's now going to be a nurse or now going to maybe not a nurse because you got to go to school for that. But if you are totally switching industries, yes, right. the bank will want you to not be on any probation. Um, sometimes there are exceptions to be made if you have really strong credit and if um, you know your down payment is sufficient and all that, but it depends. <laughs> it truly does. There's so the word of the day. Area. So our job is to try to mitigate as much of those risks that we can so we can tell a really strong story to the bank. And if we can mitigate one, two, three, and then you know four and five are still kind of iffy, there's yeah. a good chance they'll approve it. But if we have five issues or five like challenges or six, whatever it is, they're going to say, no, nah, there's too many there. You know, it's too risky for us. But if you can tell a really good story as to why we're at the position we're in, most, there's still human beings on the other side. Like the, the underwriters for the banks are humans, of course. It's not all automated. Um, and if you can tell a good story, they, they like to listen. Great. How, how much is a typical down payment these days? Yeah, minimum down payment is 5% to buy any house in our country. Um, there's a couple ways you can come up with your down payment. One is from savings, of course. Um, the other is a gift from a family member. You can pull it from your RSP. Um, depending on your credit and income, you actually are able to borrow that 5% down. The banks just call it a flex down. Um, but again, we don't see that too often because you have to have, again, really strong credit and you have to have enough money to pay back that borrowed down payment in the next five years. So. If you say you're borrowing $25,000 from the bank, that's four or 500 bucks a month. That is on top of your mortgage payment. So you have to have right. enough income to support that so plus your mortgage payment. $2,500 or $3,000 now payment. Yeah, exactly. For the next five years till that loan is paid off. But we do see a lot of savings, of course, um, lots of gifts from parents. So that's the minimum. For um, being your account for 90 days, is that? Yes, you have to have the, if it's savings, we have to prove, doesn't necessarily have to be in the account for 90 days, but we have to prove that you've had it for 90 days or where the money came from. So what the bank doesn't want to see is you take in a suit, suit, uh, sorry, suitcase full of cash <laughs> um, and deposit to the bank and say, hey, here's my down payment because they don't know where that money came from. And it's all to do with anti-money laundering and proceeds of crime. They right. want to make sure that you're not generating money through crime to buy a house mm -hmm. and it's super common actually yeah maybe not so much in our area but in the larger centers it it's very common maybe so. to elaborate also on that like what if it's a revenue property like how yeah so um again so the minimum to buy a primary residence is five percent if you're buying anything other than a primary residence or a secondary residence for you or an immediate family member it has to be 20 percent down so if you're buying a rental 20 percent down is the minimum um, but if you are buying it for your kids yeah. or you sell your previous house or keep your previous house as a income property, yeah. you can buy your second house Absolutely. still as your primary with only putting 5% down. Totally. And we see that a lot is where somebody wants to upgrade. I'm going to turn my existing house into a rental. I want to buy this new house. A lot of people, it's, it's pretty funny actually. I have this conversation probably four or five times a week is, Hey, I'm buying a second home. I think I need 20% down. Don't I? Yeah. Not nope. the case. You can have ten right. homes. You can buy ten homes if you want at five percent down. Not that you want to pay the, the premiums to do that every time, but essentially you could as long as it's your primary residence or Which secondary means you're moving residence, into that house. You're moving into the house or an immediate yeah. family member is moving into that house, you can put down five percent. You cannot um, turn that to a rental immediately. You can in a couple of years if you like, but we cannot use any rental income off of that to help you qualify. Um, whereas 20% down, and this is the difference between an insured mortgage and an uninsured mortgage. So if you put less than 20% down, you have to buy a mortgage default insurance, which is typically anywhere from like three to 4% of the 
mortgage amount. Just CMHC. CMHC, Sagen, and Canada Guarantee are the mortgage insurers in our country. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to pay this insurance. It's not your insurance, it's the bank's insurance that basically says if you default on the mortgage, CMHC, which is a crown corporation owned by the government of Canada, will pay the bank back. So the bank is virtually taking no risk when they give you a mortgage for 5% down. But three or four percent more. Yep, you're paying for it for sure. So if you're buying a house for four hundred thousand dollars, you're paying twenty thousand dollars in insurance premiums. Okay. That is built into the mortgage. You don't pay it up front, of right. course. But you have to pay this premium to be able to buy that house at less than twenty percent down. And what it does, it allows banks to lend you money with less than twenty percent down. Because if if not, they can't insure it. The bank or the sorry, the mortgage won't be insured. Mm -hmm. So now the bank is taking more risk by giving you an uninsured mortgage, they're taking all the risk on it. So if you don't pay them back, they have your house. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. if it's insured, they will have the house, plus they'll have the mortgage default insurance. And I have this conversation often as well, is that if you put less down, you actually get a better interest rate because the bank is now taking less risk because it's insured by the government mm -hmm. of Canada. I know, which sounds crazy. Yeah, so it the does. harder you work, the more money you save, you know, the, the totally. higher interest rate you have, have to pay, pay. Yep. which is insane. It is, but again, <laughs> from the bank's perspective, Less it's, risk. it's more risk by yeah. not having it insured. So it's all, interest rates are all risk-based. Yep. So that's why they, they get a better rate because it's insured and they're literally taking on like zero risk other yeah. than the cost. And you might be approved loans. for it more than putting that extra money down faster. Yeah, for sure. So it, trying to which people are like, well, I have, 18% to put down, like, of course I'm gonna get yeah. approved. Well, maybe not, right? Yeah. So anytime somebody's close to like 18 or 19% down, I always will push them to try to get just a little bit more because even if you're getting a better interest rate, you're still paying a very high fee to get that interest rate. So you're essentially paying for that interest rate. Yeah. So if I can push people to save another couple thousand bucks to save that fee, even though the rate's higher, you're still gonna save tens of thousands of dollars in the long run. In the long run.